I, I, I just inspired scripture and sat on it um, as though to say, go ahead, look, see the empty tomb. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards, who were the guards? Roman soldiers, hardened men. And they what? They shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and... Tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. They went out with what? Fear and great joy. Can you do that? Boy, you better believe it. With, with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came, and they held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests, all the things that had happened when they had assembled with the, le the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Now turn, if you would, back to Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, and again, follow along, if you would, as I read, beginning in verse 11. Titus 2, 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, speak these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for the great grace that was demonstrated, your love demonstrated toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Lord, if you have so loved us, Lord, our lives should be different. Our lives should be changed. And Father, we thank you for this Resurrection Sunday this day in which we especially remember 
and reflect, consider, and, and Lord, hopefully celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Lord, I pray and ask that you would help us in this day and in these moments to be challenged not merely with what happened, but why it happened. Not merely with what you did, which is incredible. Uh, dying and rising again, demonstrating that your word is true. Demonstrating that Christ was God, is God. Demonstrating that the way into heaven is secured in Christ. Demonstrating that we have everything we need in Christ for new life. But Lord, may we, may we not just focus today on what you did. But Lord, help us to focus on what we ought to do in response. And Lord, as a result, well, we pray and we ask that you would have your way in our hearts and lives today. That we would see you for who you are. God who became a man and laid down your life for our sin. And rose again, conquering sin and death and hell. So that, Lord, our lives would be what they ought to be for your honor and glory. Guide us into your truth, we pray. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we often call it Easter. It's a day in which it seems like Christmas, like Easter, like a lot of Christian holidays that we observe more and more people, and, and maybe not more than we used to, but it seems that I, I observe it more and more, that more and more people observe these holidays without living in light of their truth. You know, we go through the motions at Christmas to give gifts. We go through the motions to, to celebrate Easter. We go through the, the motions of many of these holidays, but does the reality of what they represent impact our life? That's my burden. That's my burden this morning. Um, and it's a burden for my own life, as well as all of our lives. Um, in our recent Bible conference, and by the way, thank you all of you who took part in helping us out with the conference, with the Seder uh, coming and being here. Uh, as Greg Lote would say, thanks for coming. Uh, it was great to have you here. We appreciate that. What a, what a blessed time. We've gotten several cards from several of the visitors that were here just thanking the church for the ministry but you know, at that conference, um, Bruce Scott taught a lot of things, but he, he taught us that God's prophetic calendar is laid out from beginning to end. And in that prophetic calendar, which, which God has given to us, we see God's just judgment is coming. And we see that his so great salvation in Christ is finished. It's secure. It's secure. And we saw that Christ is coming back. And over and over and over, Bruce Scott said what? The time is near. Are you ready? The time is near. Are you ready? And in talking with, with several of our fellows afterward, the other que another question that was raised was, so what? Christ is risen. He is coming back. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Several, a couple of years ago, I was reading a book and one author, he was talking about the fact that there are two major elements present in the Easter account. Two major elements. Number one, the fact 
Number two, the meaning. The facts of the resurrection account, you all know. We've heard those over and over, right? But what does it mean? What, what, so what? Christ became a man, died, was buried, rose again. What's the meaning to us? And he goes on to say the fact is established. The meaning, however, needs to be rediscovered by each believing soul in the church age after age till our Lord returns. We need to rediscover the truth and the reality of the resurrection every day of our life. Every day of our life. It is necessary, the author says, to discover and, per, uh, and preserve the theology of the resurrection and to guard the truth well and carefully, but that is not enough. We need to, we need to, we need to secure and preserve the, the truth, the, the facts, the theology, but that's not enough that we just know what he did. He goes on to say, we must know what the meaning is to us personally. Jesus Christ has risen. How has that impacted our lives? Did that impact our life this last week? Will it impact our life this coming week? You see, if not, we're just going through the motions of another Christian holiday. And we're talking about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Probably the, the most prominent truth in, in our Christian faith is the resurrection of the Lord. How is it impacting our life? And then the author said this, we must seek to experience the present riches of the Easter triumph in our life every day. Easter is more than sunshine and lilies. Easter is about new life in Christ. And that's what I want us to, to talk about today. And that's why partway through the Bible conference, I don't know how many of you caught this or saw this or thought anything. Again, I think weird things, I think. But partway through the Bible conference, Bruce Scott put Titus 2, 11 to 15 up on the screen. And I went, what? This just seems like an oddball text. You know, why? why? And, and yet he went after it for a few moments. And, and then I started looking at it and I started reading it and I started thinking, wow. Do you know what Titus 2, 11 to 15 does? It really outlines what a life lived in light of the resurrection looks like. What a life lived in light of the resurrection looks like. And so today, for our text, I want us to look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. And, and I want you to notice several things. Before we get into to five things from it, I want to remind you of the context in Titus chapter 2, the context of chapter 1 leading up to this, I think, is important. The, the first thing I, I want you to, to just consider is in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, Paul is writing to Titus. And he says he is writing to him according to the faith. He's writing to him and you and I according to the faith and the acknowledgement of the truth. Folks, this, this message is coming in relation to, in regards to, and according to the faith. If we are a believer, these truths should be ours. This is truth. This is God's truth. And it accords not only with truth, but with godliness. Again, I, I'm, I'm fearful that many people walk through the motions of churchianity and, and, and Christmas and Easter and all the Christian holidays, 
But there's very little truth and very little godliness, if any, attached. That can't be. That can't be. And so Paul is writing to Titus in regards to the faith and the truth and godliness. And then in, in chapter 1, 9 to 16, he says to Titus, I want you to go to Crete and I want you to set the things in order and I want you to appoint elders because I want the elders to be able to hold fast the faithful word as it has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Why? Verse 10. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And he says, therefore, rebuke them sharply. What? What, Paul? Titus, I want you to put men in the church who will rebuke sharply those who are teaching false doctrine. Why? Well, look at it. He says in verse 13, they re rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. They, now watch verse 16. They what? They profess to know God. They profess to know God. But in works, they, they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Do you know why Paul wanted Titus to put fellows in leadership positions who would handle the word accurately? Because there were many people within Christendom who professed to know God. They would have professed to celebrate Easter. They would have professed to celebrate Christmas. But in their works, they... Denied him. They, they said it, but they didn't live it. And then in chapter 2, then in chapter 2, and, and we've talked about this in this church. I know I have, and I know Jim has. But in chapter 2, look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of Titus. He says, but as for you, Titus, you speak the things which are proper for what? Sound doctrine. Okay, now stop for a minute. But you, Titus, you speak the things that are proper for sound doctrine. Doctrine is what we believe. What we know, what we understand, what we believe. He says, I want you, Titus, to, to teach the things that are proper for sound doctrine. And then in the next few verses, watch what he does. Verse 3. That the older men... What's the next word? What's the next word? Okay, not the next two words. That the older men... What's the next word? Be reverent of good behavior. Temperate, sound in faith. Look at verse 3. Timothy, Titus, I want you to teach the things that are proper for sound doctrine. Verse 3, so that the older women likewise that they, what's the next word? Be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine. Verse 4, Titus, I want you to teach the things that are proper for sound doctrine. Verse 4, that older women admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to, what's the next word? B. Verse 6. Likewise, exhort the young men to, what's the next word? B. Verse 9. Exhort bond servants to B. What's the point? The point is, is sound doctrine leads to being. And if my sound doctrine does not lead to me being, I've missed it. 
Do you see that? It doesn't matter what I think and say I believe about Easter and the resurrection, if it doesn't change my being, I don't understand the resurrection. And my friends, that's been the enemy's tool since the get-go. Know God's word. Has God said? Yeah, but just twist its meaning so that you don't be what God's word says you should be. And that's the context. Because in the very next section, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says to Titus, for. For what, Paul? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In other words, that whole idea of, of no sound doctrine, teach sound doctrine so that old men, old women, young men, young women, servants, be what we ought to be is because the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. That's why. That's why you and I should be what we should be. Not because the preacher says it. Not because my parents tell me, although my parents should tell me, and the preacher should be faithful at saying it. But because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And my friend, the grace of God that brings salvation appearing to all men is what Easter is all about. Amen? It's about the grace of God. And so I want you to notice with me five things. Number one, in verse 11, Easter and the resurrection is about the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to all men. What is the grace of God, folks? What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God giving you and I what we do not deserve. If you have worked and earned it, it is no longer grace. If you think you deserve it, it is no longer grace. It is a gift. And the grace of God that brings salvation, deliverance. Deliverance from what? Sin and death and hell. Do you realize that that's why Christ came? To seek and to save the lost. Folks, if you don't think you're lost, you don't need Jesus. He can't save you. He won't save you. But if you understand you're a wretched sinner and you're in need of a Savior, then Christ's grace is sufficient for you. But that grace... The incarnation, let me go back for a minute. What is the grace of God? It is God becoming a man. It's the incarnation. It's God leaving heaven and becoming a man. Born of a virgin. Raised. Lived. A sinless life. And then died. But my friend, why did he die? Did he die because of his sin? Did he die because of something wrong he did? Why did he die? <clears throat> Takes away. He died because I'm a sinner. He took away our sin. Can you say that this morning? He died because of me. Not him, not her, me. That's why he died. And, and again, folks, if we don't believe that, we don't understand the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died for me. He came to seek and to save the lost. The incarnation, the sinless life, the substitutionary death, and the resurrection. Over and over, if you notice the word resurrection in the New Testament Gospels, watch and you'll see over and over, God raised him from the dead. God raised him 
from the dead. Jesus did not raise himself. God the Father raised him. Why? Because the wrath of God was justified. It was, it was satisfied in Christ. Behold my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he rose for your justification and mine. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the grace of God. That's what he did for you and I. That's the message of the resurrection day of Easter. But notice this. That grace of God that brings complete salvation has appeared to who? To all men. That's that mystery we just sung about. That mystery that was hidden for ages has been made known in Christ and is made known to the world through preaching, through proclamation. It has been made known. Uh, God has made this gift of grace known from the very beginning. If we went back and looked at Genesis 3.15, from the very beginning, God prophesied about the seed of the woman that would crush the serpent's head. And that seed is Christ. From the very beginning, he proclaimed that. In Psalm 19, the word of God tells us that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the firmament shows his handiwork night unto night, day unto day. In every language, that message is heard. What message? There is a God to whom you're responsible. There is a God. But then he goes on in the second part of Psalm 19 to say the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Not only does creation declare it, but his written word has declared it. And not only has his written word declare it, declared it, but the living word, Jesus Christ, has declared it. My friend, God has made himself known. I, I never forget years ago watching a, a video, and you get on YouTube and Google it, you'll find it, but Ben Stein interviewed Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is one of our world's leading atheists and, and spokesmen. By the way, it's interesting, in this video, he actually says that he believes that the idea of intelligent design is a good, a, a good, good possible truth, but just not God. There's an intelligent designer, if you look around, but just not God. But Ben Stein, partway through it, said to Richard Dawkins, this atheist, he said, well, just what if you died someday and ran into God? What would you say? And, and he quoted Bertrand Russell, who was an atheist from the turn of the century, who said this, and he, he, he quoted him, I, I guess, word perfect. I'm just telling you what he said. He said, sir, here's what I would say to God. Sir, why did you take such pains to hide yourself? Are you kidding me? Hide yourself? My friend, from the very beginning, God has made himself known to you and I. As sovereign Lord, God, creator, sustainer. But the one who came to save our souls. My friend, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You say, well, but wait a minute. What about the unreached people groups? Let me ask you a question. No, let's turn and look at a text. Look at Genesis chapter 9 with me, please. Genesis chapter 9. Now, are there people groups that haven't heard the gospel for many, many years that need to be reached? Are there? Yes. Many people groups that need to hear the gospel. But let me ask you a question. Where did those people groups come from? Look at Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18. Um... 
And, and let me back up to verse 15. Genesis 9. No, wait. I'm in 8. Let me get to 9. Uh, Genesis 9.18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these three, what? The whole earth was populated. Now let me ask you a question. Those unreached people groups scattered all over our world, where did they come from? Their great, 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 great was Noah. And they knew. But do you know what happened over time? What happened over time is what Romans 1 tells us. Romans 1 verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Do you know what's true of many of those unreached people groups? They're worshiping the sun. They're worshiping cattle. They're worshiping... Do you know why they're worshiping those things? You know, we've probably all been told, well, they're seeking for God. No, they're worshiping those things because they rejected God in previous generations and exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Now, do we need to get the gospel to them? Yes, we do. But my friend, we need to understand something. The people groups and the persons and the individuals that reject God now, reject God now because they worship and serve self and this creation rather than the God who created them. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to who? All men. There's a second thing I want you to see. I, and, and that's this. Because the grace of God has appeared, the grace of God trains us. It trains us. Look at, look at verse 12. Again, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. The grace of God teaches do you know what that word is? I could have my sister Marlon stand up. She's a teacher. That's the word. The grace of God is a teacher. It's the idea of the one who trains and educates and instructs. Question. What has God's grace taught you? What is God's grace teaching you? That grace that we just talked about that brings salvation, deliverance from sin and eternal damnation. What does it teach us? Well, Paul tells Titus here several things. Number one, it teaches us to deny some things. It teaches us to reject some things. It teaches us to say no to two things. What is it? To deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Folks, if, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ doesn't teach you and I to say no to sin, we don't understand the resurrection like we should. And I would contend that's probably true of every one of us. We need to grow in that. So, so don't take what I'm saying here to say that, well, Jeff feels like he's got it all together or that we need to be perfect. That's not the point. But is God's grace teaching you to say no to sin? If not, you're walking through motions with this Easter. Because it will train us, it will teach us to reject two things. Ungodliness. What is ungodliness? Ungodliness, one, one term used in the lexicon is impiety. You know, that, that's a bad word today. It's the idea of living in light of the reality and the presence of God. 
I mean, if a holy God is really right here, right here, how should you think, speak, and act this afternoon? Would you say things differently? We would deny ungodliness. You know, I am reading a book right now about the Ten Commandments, and it talks about taking the Lord's name in vain. And I will just tell you that every time I see OMG, I cringe. Because I think, do we know who we're talking about? Do we live a life in light of who God is? Kids, in relation to your parents, do you relate to your parents in light of the fact that God exists and brought grace to save you? Husbands, wives, do we relate to each other in light of God? Do we reject ungodliness in our relationships, in our workplace, in our church, in our fellowship? Grace will teach us to deny ungodliness. And secondly, what? Worldly lusts. What's worldly lusts? Desiring the things the world desires. Feeling like the world feels. Allowing the world's motivations and feelings and desires to lead and guide me. You know what grace does? Grace says, no, I, I can't do that. I cannot allow the worldly lusts, the desires for the things of this world and the things that unbelievers, that cannot guide me. My friend, grace teaches you to say no to that. But it also teaches us to do certain things. Look at the text. Not only does it train us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, but it trains us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. If we understand the grace of God that was brought to us in Christ, we will be taught to live life a certain way. And he uses three terms. What's the first one? Soberly. I don't think it has anything to do with this text. Although that would fit under the umbrella. The idea is to live Thoughtfully, seriously. When we get up in the morning, do we think, oh, I got a day, I can do anything I want. Or do I get up in the morning and think, okay, Lord, how should I use this day for your honor and your glory? What do you want me to do today? And, and the things that I choose to do, are they really in keeping with what you desire and you want and your word says? Or do we just see it as our day to, Spend any away. The idea is it trains us to live soberly. It trains us to live righteously. The idea of righteousness here is justly, fittingly. If, if sober is our attitude, righteousness is our action. We need to, grace will teach us to honor and serve God in our attitude as well as our action. To live soberly, to live righteously, to live godly. Again, the word godly is one of the most fascinating words in, in, in my thought in regard to the Christian life. It's practicing the presence of God. If we're believers, he's with us. And everywhere we go, we need to live like God's with us. And he's there to guide. He's there to direct. He's, he's there to give wisdom. He's there. And he's there to spank. Do we live in light of God's presence? And notice this. And we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly. When? When? In this present age. Oh, well, you, but you don't understand. No. In this present age. It is not too hard 
for God's grace, which is sufficient to enable and help you and I to live a life that pleases God and honors God and that has resurrection power and hope and joy and peace in 2022. Amen? If I don't believe that, I don't understand Easter. I don't understand the resurrection. Now, struggle with that? Yeah. But every time I start to struggle, it's like, okay, Lord, I need to get my eyes fixed back on you and not me. I need to get my eyes fixed back on you and not my circumstances. And the resurrection life of Christ will enable you and I to live in this present age. And again, that's what Easter is all about. So the second thing I wanted you to notice is because the grace of God trains us. It trains us to put off and put on. There's a third thing I want you to notice. Look at verse 13. We need to live in light of the resurrection because the grace of God motivates us with the blessed hope of Christ's return. The blessed hope of Christ's return. The grace of God motivates us with that. Verse 13, we are to be looking for... Stop for a minute. What are you looking for this week? Well, I hope I have a good week. Well, I... Hope I'm healthy enough to make this conference. You know, I, I hope I don't get what Cheryl had so I can go to this conference. And, and I'm looking for, you know, we look for so many things. But are we looking for Christ to come back? I mean, when we, Bruce, man, Bruce, over and over, the last weekend with Bruce here, he'd say, we'll, we'll go do that if, if Christ tarries. If Christ tarries, you know, and I'm, I'm like, you know something I don't, Bruce? You know what? You <laughs> he was looking for Christ's return. And again, if we understand the grace of God that, that we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, we will be those and should be those who are looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice two things here. We're to be looking for, the idea is anxiously anticipating, awaiting with confident patience. Awaiting with confident patience. Knowing he's coming, and he's coming when the time is right, and until then, I'll keep serving. That's the idea here, is waiting with confident patience. And I know I, I have dumb illustrations, but when I think about waiting, I think about me at, at 10, 11 years old at 310 South Grand Street, waiting for my dad and brothers to get home from opening day of deer season. I was glued to the windows, looking up the street, waiting for that satellite station wagon to come around the corner in the hopes of seeing some deer on top. But I wasn't patiently waiting. Man, I was pacing back and forth, and I was... Uh, and I know some of you would say, no, that's a dumb thing to wait for. I understand that. But that's not this. This is waiting, and he's coming. And I know he's coming. And when he comes, there's going to be a blessed hope and a glorious appearing. But until then, May I serve him faithfully till he comes. But you see, if I'm not worried about when he's coming or thinking about his coming, I get kind of laxed in my service. I get kind of laxed about living godly. I get kind of laxed about really mindfully, seriously, soberly thinking about what I'm doing and not doing. But if I really think that he could return at any time, will that change our life? Will that impact what we do and don't do, what we say and don't say, what we think and don't think? But notice two things. We're to be looking for the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? 
The blessed hope is that hope that blesses our soul. Do you know what my hope is for tomorrow? My hope for tomorrow is a risen Lord. Do you know what my hope is in death? My hope in death is a risen Lord. Do you know what my hope is for a hundred years from now? It's my risen Lord. Do you know what my hope is for me to walk through this week at this conference and make it beneficial and helpful and, and what it ought to be? It's my risen Lord. Because I know if Jeff's in control, it won't be what it ought to be. My friend, we need to be living every day looking for the blessed hope of Christ and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 1 with me, please. Look at Acts chapter 1. After Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, he appeared to several, many. And Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 records his ascension back to heaven. And here's what we read in Acts 1 and verse 9. It says, now when he had spoken these things. By the way, what had he just spoken? Acts 1.8. But you shall be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Right? Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now what manner did they see him go up? He was standing right there in his, in his, in his bodily resurrection. And they watched him go up and they're standing there gazing. And the angels appeared to him and said, what? That same Jesus, that same Jesus will so come as you saw him go. My friend, do we understand Jesus Christ is coming back? And before he left in John 14, he said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself. That's our blessed hope. And that's the glorious appearing. And my friend, God's grace of Easter will take that blessed hope and that glorious appearing and impact our life. If we live in light of the reality of it. Christ is coming back. Now, in light of that, he, when he comes back, he's going to set all things straight. He's going to set all things straight at college and career. Uh, Friday night, we were talking about forgiveness and bitterness. And we were talking about the fact that there are many terrible things that happen in our lives. But do we understand, like Joseph, am I in the place of God? No. Vengeance is his, he will repay. He will reconcile all things to himself. He will set all things straight. My friend, do we understand Christ is coming back someday and he's going to take care of all that? We don't have to worry about it. He's going to set all things straight. Secondly, of his kingdom and reign, there will be no end. You know, we look at the world powers that exist today. Do we understand, number one, that they exist only at the sovereign hand of God? And he is moving them around like pawns on a chessboard, and they are accomplishing only what he wants them to accomplish. But my friend, Jesus Christ is coming back someday, and when he does, he will rule and reign with a rod of iron for all eternity. So why am I worried? 
Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Again, I'm convinced that if I live in light of the resurrected Lord, it'll change my life. Because I know that I'm looking for a blessed hope and a glorious appearing. There's a, there's a fourth thing I want you to see in verse 14. And that is this. We need to live in light of the reality of the resurrection because the grace of God gives us victory, it gives us belonging, and it gives us purpose. Look at verse 14. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from what? Every lawless deed. Every lawless deed. Every wicked lawless deed. And purify himself for himself his own what? His own what? His own special people. Who are what? Zealous for good works. You see, I need to live in light of the resurrection because if I do and as I do, God gives me victory. He gives me victory. First of all, he has come to redeem me from every lawless deed. Do you know what the word redeem means? It means to ransom. It is, it is as though God looked down and saw sinners like you and I caught in the slavery to sin. And God said, I'm purchasing them. I'm taking you out of the slave market of sin and you're becoming mine. That's what Easter is about. He came to pay a ransom for many. And, and folks, don't miss this. He has redeemed us from what? Every lawless deed. Can you say that with me? Every lawless deed. Do you know what that word means? Wicked. Wickedness. Transgression of God's law. Christ came to redeem you from every wicked deed. I don't know who you are here today. But I can tell you, based on the authority of the word of God, that every wicked deed that you look back on and think, man, I can't believe I did that. Man, ugh. Christ will redeem you from everyone. That's the victory that the resurrection demonstrates. Redemption from every wicked deed. Every lawless deed. But, but secondly, he gives us belonging. Because not only does he redeem us from every lawless deed, but he purifies for himself his own special people. He takes sinners like you and I, and he picks us up out of the kingdom of darkness, and he sets us down in his family. You're mine. You're my child for all eternity. You were Satan's. And, and see, that's the part that many of us don't want to hear and don't want to admit and don't want to come to. But my friend, it's true based on the authority of the word of God. You and I have all desperately sinned and come short of God's glory. And, and apart from the grace of God in Christ, we are Satan's children and we will be for all eternity. But Christ came to redeem you and to make you his own special people. Now, can I caution us about something there? Don't make that about you. Make that about Christ. Because he doesn't redeem us because we're special people. He redeems us as sinners and he makes us his own special people. For all eternity. God wants to give you victory. God wants to give you belonging. And thirdly, God wants to give you purpose. We are, we are redeemed from every lawless deed and purified for himself as his own special people so that what would be true? 
verse 14. That we would be zealous for every good work. Zealous for good works. Do you know what Easter should do? If I live in light of the reality of it, I should be zealous for what? Are you with me? Did I lose you? You sleep? We should be zealous for what? Question. Is that us? Was that us this last week? Will it be us this week? Zealous, zealots for good works, for work that is good in light of God. Understand, if not, I'm just walking through the motions of Easter. I'm just walking through the motions of Christmas. I'm just walking through the motions of, of churchianity. And I'm not living in light of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that grace will give us absolute victory, incredible belonging in the family of God, and incredible purpose to be zealous for good works. Now, now stop for a minute and think about this. Zealous for good works when and where? Everywhere. You go to work tomorrow, you go to work to serve Christ. You find yourself at the ER this week, you go there to follow Christ. You go home to your spouse, you go home to be zealous for good works as a child of God in light of Christ's grace and mercy in your life. Kids, you go to school this week, young people, sorry, you're not goats, I know. My mother said that. They're not goats. Young people. You go to school this week. You go to school this week. If you're a believer, you go as a child of God. As God's child. With everything you need for victory over everything in your life. And you be zealous for works that honors and serves and glorifies your heavenly Father. Amen? Amen? Zealous for good works. Again, if I'm living in light of the reality of the resurrection, the grace of God gives me victory, belonging, and purpose. And then lastly, verse 15, we need to live in light of the, the resurrection because the grace of God establishes absolute truth. Absolute truth. Verse 15, Paul says this to Titus. He says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Now, now Paul, how can you say that? Because this is God's truth. And he says to Titus, speak these things. Speak these things. Talk about them. Exhort. Well, now, wait a minute. I believe that, and it's good for me, but you mean I should tell others that this should be true in their life too? Should we? Absolutely. Why? Don't you want them to have the same victory, the same belonging, and the same purpose? Don't you want them to have a blessed hope? Don't you want them ready when Christ returns? Then you better exhort it. And you better speak it. And do it with all authority. Now, my authority? My authority? Everybody go like this. No way. But God. God. You say, well, that's not popular in our world. Folks, they crucified Christ. They crucified Christ. He did it perfectly. You and I, we mess up. But speak it with all authority. Why? Because we need to not be worried about others despising us. We need to be worried about what God the Father thinks. Will he say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Do you know what? He can. 
but I've got to live in light of the resurrection for that to happen. So my friend, in closing, in a world of uncertainty, the resurrection brings absolute truth and hope and guidance and direction and power and hope that is sure and certain. But we need to live in light of it. And that's what I want to challenge us with this Easter is live in light of our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? We love to sit down and just talk. Because that ought to mean all kinds of different things in your life and mine. And I want to encourage us all to prayerfully seek God's guidance in applying those truths in our lives. Father, help us. I pray. Lord, even as we close this time, I can't help but think that, Lord, the, the, the truth of your grace that brings salvation is the truth that would help every last one of us in this room with the things we're facing, the things we're wrestling with, the things we're dealing with, the, 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 the things that seem insurmountable. Lord, you want to bring to us that blessed hope. You, you want to bring to us that looking that patiently waits for you, our blessed hope, to return. But Lord, until then, uh, Lord, you, you, you give us in Christ all the resurrection power. The, the same power of God that worked in raising Christ from the dead is the same power that you told us in Ephesians is at work in us who believe. And Lord, we, you have given us everything we need to live victoriously, uh, to live confidently, to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age, uh, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, but Father God, we know that that won't happen until we bow the knee to you, our resurrected God and Lord and Savior. And Father, as we close, I, I come to you in prayer and I ask that if that's the need in somebody's heart here today, that before any and all of this can be true in their life, they've got to humble themselves before you. And we need to confess, repent, and trust you and your grace to deliver us from every wicked deed, to purify in us your own special people, and to make us zealous for good works. Father God, I pray that you'd work in our hearts. And, and Lord, help in these moments. That Lord, if there are any that need to come to you and receive from you that gift of forgiveness and salvation, that today they would do it. And Lord, I pray that you would do a work in every area of our life to cause us to live in light of the resurrection power and life of Jesus Christ. And may you be glorified, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If there's a need on your heart, we would love to meet with you, talk with you after the